What's up, everyone, and welcome to the RRBG podcast. In this episode, it's the return of Tristan Schoen of Author and Punisher. They have a new album coming out February 11th called Crueler, available on Relapse Records. We talked a lot about the creation of that album, the visual aspect of the album. We talked about how Tristan is adapting his live show and bringing out a guitar player for this tour that's coming up. He's doing a short run in Europe and then doing a few West Coast dates, so make sure to keep an eye out for that. We talked about an upcoming Author and Punisher beer that they're making, a Black Kolsch. We talked about when Author and Punisher went on tour with Tool and how they got involved in the new album as well. It's a fun conversation. I hope you guys enjoy it. Follow him on social media at Author Punisher on all the things. Pick up the new record on Relapse Records or go to TristanShone.com. Make sure to click subscribe down there. Hit the little bell. Make sure you can get notifications and we get more exposure onto the algorithm and all that. And support the podcast by checking out Patreon.com slash RRBG and help us keep this show running. Cheers. Quick business thing. Shout out to Killcliff. Thank you guys for sending me these energy drinks. They keep me awake so I can talk to people on the internet. Uh, this is my favorite flavor, the cherry limeade. It's it's the best. I, I mean, these energy drinks usually taste super chemically, or you could taste that like aspartame, like fake sugar crap. This stuff just tastes delicious. Mm. Anyway, I actually stopped myself because it's got like 150 milligrams of caffeine. And it tastes so good that I always want like a second one. I'm like, no, I'm going to die. <laughs> I'm going to die. Um, anyway. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the RRBG podcast. I'm here with Tristan of Author and Punisher. Welcome back to the show, dude. How you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. I am uh, just took too many gummies last night before bed, so I'm, I'm uh, sort of just, you know, I'm trying <laughs> to get the cobwebs off, but... Uh, Try not to drink as much, so I kind of overdid it on the gummies this time, but, you know. I see, I see. That's good. I mean, it's important to take little breaks from the different things, you know, like yeah. I'll, I'll stop drinking, but I'll smoke a little extra weed or, or eat some edibles and vice exactly. versa. Vice versa, you want to take a break from the edibles and maybe you have a drink instead and then you know, that you go too far in that angle, get too many tequila shots in. <laughs> exactly exactly i sleep a lot better this this is the way that it works better you know for the health but uh i'd rather be a little groggy and then be hung over to tell you the truth yeah yeah because <laughs> i mean like groggy you could just take some coffee or some kill cliff and no, i'm just kidding exactly <laughs> yeah man i've been i've been also you know thankfully with the show the show's doing well enough to where people are sending me stuff and that's awesome the edibles are uh they're a whole different game. I'm scared of them a little bit because like, yeah. with joints, I could just, you know, I know how many I could take like a couple hits and I'm like, all right, I'm good. Uh, but with edibles, it's like, ah, eh, not really feeling anything. And then all of a sudden you're glued to the couch. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh no, what happened? Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, last time we spoke, you were, I think you were driving uh, on the show. Last time we spoke on the show, uh, we've, yeah. we've, we've spoken in person since then, but uh, you were like driving on tour, I think, and you were like building stuff on the road, like a maniac. Probably had some sort of thing that we decided to change up halfway through. And yeah. <laughs> uh, but now you're here. You've got a new album coming out, February 11th. Uh, Krula, Krula, am I pronouncing? Yeah, that? exactly. Krula. Um, tell me a little bit about it, man. I mean, I heard the two songs that are out right now. Uh, Maiden Star just came out, and um, the other one. What was the other one's name? Drone, drone carrying dread yeah yes yeah man these are these are i mean those two are kind of the songs that i think carry the feeling of the album the best for me you know they were kind of the first two kind of riffs when i got back you know in the beginning of the pandemic when i started writing just to hit these sort of trying to redefine the sound a little bit from the low end perspective like hitting the subs in a different way and um yeah and those two songs have these sort of chords these fifths that i hit on some synths and sort of bend some of the other notes into it that gives it this sort of i don't know it's just like a bellowing low end but also kind of a sort of a melodic you know there's not a lot of like cynicism and angst in these songs there's a little bit more like uh positivity i guess Hmm. you know if we're talking about like you know it's the closest i'm going to get to making like an emo record you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I I noticed that there is a change in terms of of mood. I guess you could say towards the music. Um, yeah, 
you know, whereas the previous work is a little more aggressive, a little more angst, like you said. And this one, I definitely felt it a little bit more melodic, even though you do still sing in other songs and there is melody in other songs yeah. from your past. This does have a little bit more melody to it. And it feels more drone. Like, I know that the name of the song is Drone <laughs> Carrying Dread, but it is a little droney in, the, in that sense of, you know, very, uh, you know, spacey sounding. Which, you know, also on those two songs, you know, I, I can't, I can't, this record cannot be uh, talked about without mentioning uh, Phil Scrosso and um, John uh, Jason Began, uh, Viter, who, who basically co-produced this and the last three recordings with me. Um, he's, uh, you know, does all that electronic stuff, you know, I'll write some melodies for synth, but then giving it to him and he just creates these like textures and uh, writes some parts and his like a uh, plethora of synths allows me to like really find the, the, you know, I'm, you know, when, when I come up with those melodies, I'll just use some software synths that I have or some hardware synths, but I don't really curate that sound and get deep into it. And these are people that, you know, he, he's like, okay, this is what it needs to sound like. And he'll find that sort of John Carpenter, you know, eerie kind of broken synth to drone that I need. Um, you know, same with Phil, you know, he, I haven't had guitar since 2010 and he, uh, like drone putting like Ebo and slide and then on these like parts, it kind of like mush the parts together in an organic way, which, you know, is hard for me to do, you know, sometimes, I mean, I have the sliders, but to do it in this kind of, in that mid to high frequency range, they just nailed it. Nice, man. And does this create any kind of complication for you uh, taking it on the road? Like now you have to figure out how to get these sounds from other folks into the live show. Well, I'm bringing a guitar player now. Um, ah, there we go. Okay. Sadly, Phil won't be able to tour because his band is uh, much more popular and uh, makes a lot more <laughs> money than I do. And he's got a tour with them. So, um, but Doug Sabalek, who's uh, from a band called ecstatic vision, uh, he's out of Philly and, um, He's, his older band is called The Life Once Lost, who you might know. I know that um, band. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, kind of killer metalcore sort of uh, – it sort of blended his last album with with The Life Once Lost, sort of took on this like kind of droney trance-like thing. And I really love that last album that they did, and that became Ecstatic Vision, which is his new band, which is um, – you know, they've got a saxophone player, a couple of drummers, um, unique – but he's a shredder man and he we've known each other for a long time so a lot of it for me is just having a dude that i will enjoy touring with as a human being so yeah i mean how long has it been since you've played shows with somebody else on stage probably like 2008 or nine Oof. um so you know and then also the tracks that danny and justin from tool played on uh I don't think I'll be getting them on the road with me. Uh, no? I, might get, <laughs> I might get one LA performance if I time it well. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I bait them down there, but uh, yeah, uh, those guys won't be playing, but just uh, Jason who did a lot of the electronic stuff, same like his stuff, that stuff will be sequenced. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, some of those synths that are up high and these kind of textures that blend some of that stuff is like so uh dialed in in the studio that i can just sequence it and it i'm still playing all the major stuff mm -hmm. but um i've got a click and i can play along to some of those yeah i mean or I we can just hit a button and trigger it you know well yeah there's that too that's what most uh, like industrial like gothy bands do where yeah you know, it's not real drums but if they play those pads that kind of you know can sequence the, the sounds it works it looks nice yeah you can like play the kick along with the ch -ch -ch -bone, ch -ch -ch -bone, yeah. you know i you know for the most part it's live but there are some things that we uh we sequence and thankfully for ableton live software uh, it makes that all easy nice man I, so tell me about working with like danny and justin like i know you you played you played some shows with him before the before, in the before times yeah um how you know and i'm sure that i was gonna ask like how did you guys meet but I, that tour is probably where that happened but tell me what it was like working with them having them you know be a part of the creative process yeah getting off the road you know we all kind of shocked and uh just danny and justin you know shared a green room and uh those guys like uh 
those guys hung out the most after shows. So I got to know them. And, and Justin, the one person who I didn't really know before the tour, he's a big soccer fan, uh, football fan. He's a Chelsea supporter. I'm a Liverpool supporter. So we were watching some matches together. And nice. so we kind of kept the conversation going um, after the tour. And we said, hey, let's do something together. And uh, it turned out that it was him playing on one of the tracks. Um, we kind of kept sort of just like, loosely talking about it but uh that one track centurion that he played on um is probably the most industrial track on the record you know kind of closest to some of the i don't know older stuff maybe closest to the stuff off of beast land like nile strength or something and so that was the one that i programmed and so that was like i had a beat that i programmed so i didn't play it i programmed it although i can play it now and so I sent some sort of synth and drum patterns to him. And then we went back and forth. Um, and it was great. I mean, hearing his tone um, was just like, yep, that's Justin's bass. And uh, those guys are big industrial fans. So, like, I didn't need to, he got it, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But uh, it was cool to get, like, a bunch of different parts from him and then sort of like, hey, I'm going to use that one and this one and then kind of craft it from all. He just gave me so much material. That's awesome, man. And then Danny was was a little bit more like he had uh, torn his, uh, I don't know, one of his muscles lifting weights. And so he wasn't able to work on it, even we had agreed to do it. And then I had to submit the album because it's like nine, eight months or something before you can get vinyl now from the, mm -hmm. from the factory. So he, uh, he, he was like, he had two weeks. He's like, okay, I'm going to do it. So he went down and he recorded it in uh, one take, or, or I don't know how many takes he took, but you know, we didn't go back and forth. He just sent me this like perfect, like super, uh, you know, I've never had that many drum hits, you know, like kicks and snares and different like levels of toms and the fills uh, on the track misery. So you'll definitely hear it. And then live, I don't really want to play those. So it'll probably just be a little bit more of an electronic sounding track without his drums in there. Okay. So it'll be, it's like not a gonna be the same. it'll be a variation. Yeah, it'll be a variation, and I don't really want to sequence it because it's it's so obviously, you know, acoustic drums. Sure, yeah. Well, that's cool, though. I mean, some bands do that sometimes. You, you look at bands like Nine Inch Nails, they have variations of their songs that they play live that are not on an album. So, I mean, that's not that's not new or, like, you know, too impossible. You know? It kind of leaves it open that if I was on tour with a, a band, let's just think of, like, a converge or something like that and that's a, that's probably not gonna happen but if it were a band <laughs> with a with a rad drummer i could be like hey danny played on this track do you want to play together on that one track on the tour um no you know no pressure just make it sound as good as danny carey yeah no no big deal <laughs> just one of the best drummers ever uh it's cool yeah. <laughs> here's this just learn it tonight and play it perfectly but I, would, I wouldn't say, you know, you, you kind of put yourself down there. You're like mentioned Converge and you're like, oh, I don't know. I was like, that's possible. I think that's a possible. It is possible, yeah. yeah. I, I don't mean it like that. I mean like um, I just don't want any expectations. No expectations, but, you know, you got to put it out there, man. It's the vision board mentality, right? You got to like throw it out. <laughs> well, if you talk to Chelsea Boltek, I, I love her and I, I love her band and the music she makes. I've always, and Yob, those are two bands that I would love to support on tour sometime. So. Well, I know Yob and I, and I don't know Chelsea, but I know, you know, the, the Converge dudes and they, they just put out an album with her and yeah, I think you just need to talk to Sergeant House. I forget, I forget, Kathy, I think is her name. You know, yeah. Her. Yeah. <laughs> she's tough nut to crack. I mean, she's just, they, they've just got such a great label and um, yeah. they're kind of the, just, I don't know. Everybody wants to tour with those bands. Of course. Understandably so. <laughs> um, so tell me about yourself during this, this whole like break that everybody had, not really a break, but you know, the time, the time of no shows, um, were you creating, trying to come up with new sounds? Were you building new instruments? Cause I know that you love doing that. Uh, what were you doing during this time? Yeah. I mean, well, the sort of new thing that we're doing, um, other than just, you know, yeah, get, getting back from tour, I really listened, you know, the, in 2020, we released a, a live thing from all the tool shows. Um, and so I was able, we recorded all of them, you know, basically like best sound systems I'm going to play on, sound engineers, their, their monitor engineers are helping me, you know, with my in-ear mixes and in ways professionals 
I, just getting different opinions from people that have been out there in the world, you know, that have been on the road with big bands. And so when I got back, I, I really had a lot of, I learned a lot and I was also able to listen to each show and say like, what do I like? What do I don't like? You know, what, what, what's not working and, and sort of be honest with myself almost as a fan, you know, listening. And so I was able to say like, Hey, this sounds really good. This stuff doesn't sound so good. And so, and then with the pandemic, I was like, if there's any time to kind of retool everything and come up with new sounds and redo this and that, this is now, you know? Um, and so I've had, like, I did that before the tool tour because I bought a bunch of new gear and I did it after. So I got to basically deciding that uh, I was going to sort of make the vocals a little different. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, the music is now on this album is very heavy. So I felt like I didn't need the vocals to be as heavy as that. They could kind of take the back seat because the kick and the tone was what was bringing the sort of heaviness. Um and then just gear wise, we we sort of decided to start this company, Drone Machines, which is this uh, kind of boutique gear company based around the instruments that I make. Oh, uh, okay. So that'll be different versions, but similar versions to what I'm using. And I'll be taking those on the road. Um, taking a little longer to get the stuff built right now, but uh, the company's called Drone Machines. Uh, you, you can find it on Instagram, underscore Drone Machines, underscore, and uh, it's Jason Began, who's my uh, who produced the record, is a partner, and then a mechanical engineer, an old friend of mine, Adam Reed Erickson, is basically taking my designs and, and making them professional products. Oh, oh. So people can now do their own, like you know, all, yeah, live shows with the playing with the the you know the handles. Well, yeah, there's certain things that we'll have and certain things that you know I'm not sure if this thing will be for sale right away because that's probably the most kind of you know it's a right-handed drum machine it's very it needs to be mounted on a table in a very specific way so that it doesn't rock back and forth there's some things about it that don't make it practical it would be incredibly expensive to make that thing and right. then all the required accessories so we're kind of going to feel this out with some of the more synth knobs sliders there's a knob called the ingot which is like this disc thing that slides and spins and you know, it'll be 19 inches and you can attach them to your modular synths and all your hardware and uh, some guitars and all open source electronics so that, you know, users can, you know, program if they want to, they can upload different files in the shareable community. So it's not going to be some super like, you know, like with a little LCD screen with a million options that you have to like look through. Yeah, this yeah. It's all like intuitive um, devices. That's awesome, man. I really like that idea. Uh, should, I mean, that, 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 when you said it, I'm like, of course, that makes perfect sense. Like that, that's a good way to extend your brand, if you want to say, you know? Yeah. And I don't want to become this, like, I don't want to be like a traveling salesman. And so it's, we're, we're going to try to, uh, it, all of that is sort of this big unknown, you know? Mm. Um, I hope it's just, uh, yeah, we're going to try to keep it like boutique and, and small. There's some companies out there that I really like that have done a really good job at sort of like maintaining, you know, smaller quantities, good quality and pay their people well at their company and all that kind of crap. Um, we enjoy this. I don't want it to become, I don't want Work. it to be not fun, you know? Yeah. 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 So we're, I wouldn't say I'm going to quit my day job. We'll just see. We'll see. Okay. Hey, if it takes off, you never know. Yes. Now you got to start doing NAM. You got to start showing up at NAM to sell your devices you know i know i know <laughs> and, I'm like, hand shakes. and like oh, that doesn't sound fun but, <laughs> but there's some other ones that are fun like uh super booth up in berlin and mm. there's one in chicago i think called knobcon a little small knobcon <laughs> yeah big knob <laughs> that's awesome uh you, you know, i should just write one that says knob end on a t-shirt and i'll be like yeah i'm a this is knobcon right <laughs> um you know it's funny you mentioned the uh the the vinyl press uh being so delayed i just got a vinyl that i completely forgot i pre-ordered back in like april yeah, yeah. i forgot and i was like what is this and i open it up as the new not the new it was uh kill switch's end of a heartache mm. i completely forgot that they had done that and it's been almost a year <laughs> Like a repress, yeah. Yeah, it's it's nuts, man. I, how do we? I mean, maybe that's a business that people need to start looking into making more of. Like, we need more vinyl press plants. How about that? 
Well, there are, yeah, there's some smaller ones. Like there's some in LA around the U S but they just don't do the quantity. I think mm. that, um, because you know, if you look up, I forget what it's called. There's, there's, there's a bunch around in the U S there's just, and there's also some DIY ones that you can buy these machine, these things now. Um, so I imagine that's going to be like a hey, 3d print your own fucking vinyl pretty soon or something. <sighs> yeah. I mean, I don't know how I feel about it. I mean, that's cool. I still don't know how I feel about 3D printing. I feel like it's still cheap. Like anything, I, I know that it's not. I've seen some really good things, like props for cosplay and whatever. Yeah. But but still, it just feels cheap. <laughs> There's no way that that can be real. Good for prototyping, you know. Yeah. It's almost like you would make dub plates or something. You know, basically just make your like, you know, hey, I'm a small band DIY and I'm gonna make ten for tour or something. Um, yeah. Back in the day, we made mixtapes and CDs and shit. But now nobody wants to buy that stuff. They just want vinyl. So it's like, um, yeah, it's an interesting time. Like for me, it's definitely vinyl. I don't buy CDs or cassettes or anything. I and I know that cassettes are in with like certain metal bands, but yeah, I grew up with cassettes and they suck. Yeah, you know what I mean. I had the pencil to rewind it and I fixed the warped. You know, actual tape itself is gets warped if you leave it out. Like I just, it's too much work. Yeah. So now, now it's just digital, and then the vinyl is the collector's kind of thing. To, to you know, when I'm home, I'll listen to that. But when I'm out, I'm not going to walk around with a Walkman anymore. Come on. Friday night, yeah, you, when you're you know making some good food and having some drinks, it's a great time to throw on the vinyl. You know, when you're when you're not stressed about anything, you can just sort of take your time. Yeah. The only the biggest stress is having to flip it to the other side later on when they, when we get to it. Um, you so you're going on tour soon, a couple of weeks in uh, Europe. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Stay tuned. We're 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 still kind of monitoring COVID on that one. Um, mm. yeah, as I imagine most people think we are, so we'll we'll have to making some tough decisions. But uh, that one is is still up in the air because I'm trying to wait and see what happens with UK. I think I have to give them an answer in a few days. I don't know when this podcast is airing, but. Uh, but the, but for sure we've got some dates uh, in March in the U.S. and uh, L.A. and in San in Oakland and um, then up, I believe we're going to be putting some Northwest dates in, in between those. Um, so a nice little short run, um, which I think is a good way to do things right now. These little short little clumps because if you lose one or you lose a show, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, yeah. It it's might better. even be like a new a new. Uh, New normal, sort of a, yeah. A new sort of touring scheme is to just sort of do these like long weekends. Um, yeah, it's it's not you can't book out you know a three month tour and then you make all these merch, print all these shirts out, and then it, it gets canceled. And then now what? I like the idea of smaller tours. Also, it keeps it fresh with the the you know the opening acts and whatnot. To, you know, whoever yeah. is going to be a part of it. Um, but have you hey, played any shows? Yeah. Have you played any what? Have you played any shows since the pandemic? No. Nope. Nothing. So this is no, and it's pretty nervy now. I, I was when I actually this UK tour was really like, I'm like fuck, man, this is really happening. I need to get my shit in, in gear, you know. Yeah. Have you done a lot of rehearsals or anything? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and recording myself and you know looking at my gear and saying like, uh, hey, that's because for Tool, I I kind of built like a big rack, a rolling rack with these these amps for these speakers that i have and you know just kind of like too much gear because they were carrying it so i didn't have to worry about the weight mm. and now i'm looking at like you know fly if i fly to my parents house on the east coast i have my other van there that died for a long time but i fixed it so it's sitting in my dad's field <laughs> so now i've got my second my 2004 sprinter van that's full of like chipmunks living in it but it still works <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be uh, driving that. So I've got to fly there, you know, and keep my gear quantity down. So I got to rebuild, you know, my whole rack, which is sort of like, those are the things that cause me problems is all the wiring. You know, it's not my instruments. It's the, uh, yeah, it's just the hardware, you know, making sure that the drivers and software and all the cabling is professional. So, uh, and then getting the vo the vocals and the guitar to all of my playing on the songs, that stuff is dialed in. It's the vocals and the guitar. Mm -hmm. um, the other, the parts that are new on this album, those are the ones people are going to be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Scrutinizing. Scrutinizing. 
Yeah. yeah. I'm very, but I've been recording it. It's pretty good. Uh, a lot less distortion on the vocals. So I'm, I'm standing up there without any clothes on. Oh, okay. All right. So have you been taking any kind of vocal lessons or, or anything special, anything different? Warm ups. Warm ups. Just warm. Yeah. Awkward warm ups. And uh, I, I, I definitely note it. And then just, recording and in the in-ears because i was able to listen to um a couple times on the tool tour they let me listen to maynard's in-ear mix and because i was the heaviness is just filling up the whole stage even with my in-ears and no no speakers blaring at me you're like well wait where's the pitch it's there's so much tone you know yeah and so they they helped me really dial that mix in a way um depending on how much bass you can feel you can take that out of your ears and so I, everything below like 150 hertz, I'd take out, and all of a sudden, your vocals, or you can really hear your vocals much better. Mm. So now all of a sudden, it's like hitting pitches is is a, you know, in a studio, it's never a problem, but then live with the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's it's working out a lot better. Um, so the confidence is up a lot more. That's great, man. Yeah, I I, I think about that too because. You know, I never got to that professional level where we had such tweaked uh, in ears or whatever. Like for me, it was monitors, and yeah, I, ne I never had in ears. Sometimes I would wear like pro level ear plugs just to not mess up my ear. But then I can't even hear anything, and all I hear is like a muffled like in your head. Like, oh, you know, it's like I don't like that either. <laughs> yeah, how did people do that? I don't get it, man. I can't. Focus. And there's still some like pros that that use monitors and ear plugs. And they sing like I'm like, how are you doing that? It's like, mm -hmm. I guess it because you kind of hear it through your skull. Yeah, it's in it's like a vibration right up here. It's nuts. <laughs> and they can they can do the pitch that way, and it's it's amazing. I maybe that would work. I haven't really, but I need a click track now anyway. Sometimes and little things when I'm droning out that tell me like, okay, you should change now, and so it tells me, you know. So mm. I'm dependent on it now. Now you have to do it. <laughs> Yeah. That's like it's like me with driving. I can't drive without GPS anymore. I used to be able to drive around like I know where I'm going. I know north, south, whatever. Now it's like if I don't plug it in on the phone, even if I'm going down the street, I'm gonna get lost. Yeah, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll put on some music and just start rocking out. And I'm like, whoop! I passed it like four blocks ago. So unless I have something constantly telling me like make a right, it's like oh okay, I gotta make a right. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's what I have. I got my little GPS, and now the guitar player Doug he needs to have fucking GPS on too. So. Yeah, um, <laughs> well, that's it. So, I mean, damn. I mean, I guess since no shows since the pandemic, and I mean, I don't want to put the fear in you, but it's just got to be weird getting up there and and trying to perform. And and I mean, I don't know how you are personally, and I don't want to get too deep in like some kind of political conversation, but like. I still have the fear, you know what I mean? When I go out and even when I go out now, I go to like the comedy store or something. I keep my distance, you know, I'll have my mask on. I'm not scared of it. I'm, you know, I'm cool, but also, you know, there's no need to just be wild and out. <laughs> yeah, no, dude. I mean, I, I, I've got some, uh, you know, I have a little heart thing. It's not really an issue, but it's a, it's a genetic just a little thing that sometimes had crept up and I, I modify, I, I keep on top of it with some meds. It's mm. not like a blockage. It's, it's kind of like not an arrhythmia, a little spasm. And so it's, you know, it's in the back of my head that, you know, there are heart repercussions to COVID. And so I have to sort of, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm N95 in it now, just, and now with this tour that we have coming up, you know, in March, and then we have another European tour after that. No, those are those are obviously question marks. But if things get back to where we were, say in September, October, where we're pretty low, um, I'll probably do it. And uh, and yeah, it's going to be like play on stage without your mask. But the second you get off the stage, put your mask on. Try to get the venue to sell your merch for you. Bring less merch so it's not as complicated. Yeah. Um, those logistics are like get in the green room, get your fucking get the fuck out of there and go drink at your hotel room or something and it's it's gonna be having to be real like because you're gonna know people in every city mm -hmm. like hey what's up you know like it's so and so and you this is person you maybe he made the fucking video of your album and he, he you owe him like everything you can <laughs> give him because you didn't pay him anything uh he, this guy knows and when he hears this podcast he'll know who i'm talking about <laughs> hey those are the homies you know but yeah <laughs> you gotta take care you gotta you got to take care of them, but also you got to take care of yourself, you know? Yeah, we, we, because if any one of us gets COVID, the tour is over and everybody involved gets fucked. 
you know, when Tool was just on tour, I had sort of thought they came through San Diego and I was like, oh, maybe I would, I don't know, maybe there would be a chance to say hello to those dudes. And and there was absolutely no chance. Like they, I don't even think they're in their green rooms. I think they're on their bus until they play. Yeah. Um, yeah. I because they're going to fuck everybody on their crew if one of them decides to bro down and then ruins it for all those people that have are working. Yeah. It's a, it's a big crew in the tool tour and everybody's got a job and everybody depends on that money. Um, and even, even in a smaller scale, even if it's just one other person, like now that person's life is in jeopardy or they have to then figure it out and go find another job or something. It's, it sucks, man. And, and I don't know how to get past it too either. Cause you know, even vaccines, like if you take it, like it's still, people still get it on the vaccine. So it's not, it, nothing's for sure. There's no fixing it. <laughs> yeah. It's just mask. I was even thinking of like, could I use a mask while singing? I'm behind my microphone anyway. Yeah. I, I don't want to do it, but if it's, it, it is possible. And then I would be, if I was able to wear that thing all the time, I'd probably fucking hate it. But, um, it's possible. You anyway. know what you, there's these new ones. There's these new ones. It's like your whole head. And it looks like a astronaut thing, like a clear glass. You know, and it might add to your aesthetic for your show. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, the Daft, the Daft Punk mask. We'll yeah, see. I get the lights inside, get some LED lights in the, <laughs> in the headset. Um, yeah, I mean, best you can do is the best you can do, right? Just keep trying, put shows out there, and keep yourself safe. Um, but people need to do it, and, and you need to have – it's weird. You need to have some kind of outlet especially when you're a musician, like you need to be able to play shows. I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know how so many musicians dealt with, um, you know, this time off of not being able to play. I don't get it. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty anxious. It was, it's been heartbreaking to have to cancel these and as for everybody, but I, there's, there's, you know, I try to like, look at like, I think I was, I don't know. I was on another podcast and someone was talking about Ian McKay and how he with the, with Fugazi, they like, he, um, they they made these like he, he painted himself in a corner that he would say like in order to sort of have limitations to bring out creativity and so like i sometimes feel like the pandemic and has i like when that happens to me it's almost like when i if i play europe and i play like a fly-in show where i'm not going to have i can't have certain things or i have to limit the amount of gear i bring it's almost like kind of a relief because i'm like oh okay i have to like pare things down and having less stuff is always makes me play better. When I have less gear on stage, I'm like, you know, if I, if I, and so anyway, this is, this, tour, these tours are kind of like that. Like, you know, we have to bring minimal stuff, um, but we still have to be really good, you know, so let's get some lights and program the lights better. And um, I don't know, that, that's kind of how I, that's kind of how I feel about this whole thing. It's, you know, these limitations of, the way it shouldn't make it worse in some ways it might even make it better because people are not having the James Hetfield gear set up. You know, they're having the, you know, the minimal. Yeah. I saw this band actors. You ever heard of them? It's a actors Vancouver band. They're like kind of a, I guess kind of like dark wave synth wave, but they're live guitars and stuff. Really good Depeche mode vibes and stuff. They had these little combo amps when I saw them play at this festival that were like one 10 or 12 inch speaker per each and it fucking rocked it was so huge they ran it through the pa and nice. um and i was thinking to myself like huh i wonder you know like i just i wonder how they got to that point and still sounded so badass anyway. yeah lots of challenges it it, it's challenging <laughs> and it makes people be more creative and try wow. to find new ways to make that sound work you know and yeah. And and that's that's the the human spirit right there just these obstacles and how can we overcome them. And I I think that is the positive thing about the pandemic is just that it gives us a moment to stop and then have to like okay, what do we do now? How do we improvise? How do we overcome this challenge, this obstacle? Yeah. Um, you know, and and it makes the be it makes for the best of us. Like this is one per one thing that I I've I truly believe it, but a lot of people will argue against me, but a lot of a lot of musicians I feel write their best stuff when they're having a struggle, when they're they're you know either financial struggle or an emotional struggle. They lost a family member or something like that. Usually brings the best out of them, 
And a lot of people are like, no, you don't need that. You know, it does. You don't need you know tr- terrible trauma to like inspire you. But like, you kind of, it works. I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, I'm wondering if there's going to be sort of a uh, let's see. So during the pandemic, a lot of bands did release, but a lot of bands also. Uh, I say like now or even 2021, you're starting to see like, is there a certain feel to the type of music that was written during that time? Is there a, are we going to look back on this and say like, oh, that was the age of like, those were the, those were the pandemic albums, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I wonder, I don't know if we fully like, uh, like Emma Ruth Rundle, her, her album that she just released, Sergeant House, the one track on there called Return was definitely one of those tracks that like, when I heard it, it was like, oof, you know, like, oh, that's like a ton of bricks, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, she was dealing with some stuff and it hit hard. Um, and I'm wondering if there's some other, some tracks. And I feel like, you know, there's certain times on moments on this album that I hit certain notes and it like makes me remember how that felt, you know? Yeah. I mean, a lot of these albums that are out now that just came out or have come out in the last, you know, late 2021, early 2022, those are all things that have been written from what I've seen. This is from my judgment from like, interviewing folks it's everybody's like yeah i wrote that in 2019 and like it just now came out because of everything that happened so it's not really written with the pandemic in mind it's just kind of now it's out and like you said i think that now we're going to start getting into some albums that have been inspired by this actual problem and there's there's already a kind of a some 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 people have done it already and there's like a weird nervousness to the music <laughs> there's a weirdness there's like an anxiety to it uh, a lot of energy but in like a nervous energy i don't know i yeah I, I feel it and and for you for your album like the way the visuals especially have kind of combined with the music there's this like futuristic kind of cyberpunky kind of uh dystopian like the end of the you know post-apocalyptic vibe to it yeah we tried to take a more like Cause you know, we, we make doom metal. That's, you know, that's what every one of these bands does. So we're all like, you know, like if you look at the bands that, that I, that I love, you know, the, the body or like uniform or, you know, with Chelsea Wolf, it's like everybody on their arm, like writes something terrible, you know, on their shirt, like, yeah. you know, like all human suffering is we deserve it, you know, like <laughs> yeah. it's just like, yeah. So I tried to, that's what Beastland land hundred percent was, was like, you know, fuck, you know, like, but the newer album is like, is I tried to like use colors and tried to take some of the cynicism out of it and try to like, look at like that post-apocalyptic survival mode in sort of the less violent way. Like we're not all of us are going to try to kill each other. We're going to actually try to still like involve culture in our lives, even after society breaks down, you know? Yeah, we're still gonna have to have music and art, and so that some of the color and, and the art and the themes, um, uh, you know, it's not a the, the vehicles were a big theme for me, like sort of these survival vehicles, Tacomas and Sprinters, and they were driving around with their tur- you know, like gas tanks and all this survival gear, and you're like, whoa, what's going on? I don't, you know, so I, I tried to like sort of imagine a different side to that that was less like militaristic yeah yeah the, the human side of it the, yeah. the of it of the the end of the world <laughs> yeah well you know it's like that show on hbo that i just watched station 11 it was like oh that, that that at least for the first few episodes that kind of like definitely captured some of the the vibes yeah i had a moment during the pandemic i know i've talked about other moments that i've had but i had a moment where there was a breakdown moment, which I've talked about where like, I thought the show live shows were done and everything. But then there was a moment like right after that, where my brain went into survival mode and I've never had that in my life. I've never been a prepper, you know what I mean? Or anything like that. But I went and I bought like a go bag. I bought some knives. I bought some guns. I'm like, well, you know, just in case. Yeah. Who knows? And you know, if nothing happens, well, at least I have some cool extra stuff laying around. If we want to go camping or something, but, but not yeah, a problem to have that stuff. You know? Yeah, it's not a problem. It's not, if you don't go crazy where you're like building an underground shelter, you know, with like years supplies of like MREs and stuff. But yeah, it was just a you know a couple things here for survival. 
but it, it, I never had that in my brain of like, oh shit, I should have that. You know, it was more like, ah, oh, we're good. Life is good. And then all this happened like, oh no, <laughs> no, no, it's not. <laughs> No, I mean, yeah, it, it, I think you're not alone there. We all had that feeling. We drove across country to see my parents during the pandemic in October, and um, you know, we camped in the van and you know had a little burner and cooked our food and tried not to go into any restaurants or anything. And uh, you know, it was, and that was in my mind. You know, thinking Good about preparation. That. Yeah, of course. If you tried to dig in San Diego, you might get down about 20 inches before you hit the uh, <laughs> bedrock. Yeah. No yeah. basements here. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Wow. I mean, well, there is, isn't there uh, what they call the the boobies that are on the road down from L.A. to San Diego, those nuclear things? There's got to be some kind of shelters in that area, right? There's probably some shelters in, in, in uh, Pendleton or whatever. Yeah, Camp Pendleton, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, definitely in the desert. There's those desert rats out there for sure. Yeah. You know, Arizona is not far away, and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of shelters there. Shelters and uh, mafia victims uh, get buried out in the desert, right? <laughs> yep. Wasn't that Breaking Bad taught us that? Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to, that that picture of you on your website that you're standing in front of this ridiculous like machine and it looks like a junkyard. Where is that? Oh, that's the San Diego dump. Really? Uh, I, I was going to assume like somewhere in, in like Europe. Yeah. So that was uh, Becky. De Giglio, uh, who's um, who's a photographer in San Diego, um, I asked her to do some photos for me for promo. And I had these, I had two ideas. One was to go try to find these wiener schnitzels that were broken. If you scroll to the bottom of my website, um, you'll see that picture. Because um, they've been kind of, the wiener schnitzels have been slowly all going out of business. And then uh. they'll just, they'll just sit there and kind of like, be taken up by some unhoused people or then they'll get burned or who knows. And so they just, it's such a, it's such a remnant of like American, uh, I don't know, decay. So I was like, okay, we're going to go there. So we, and we had to climb over the fence and get in there and convoy, which is like all where all the good Asian food is in San Diego. And so we're standing there doing these metal photos, people, or it's a very busy area. And then we went to the dump. And so it was a real, uh, it was a nice date. Um, nice, but yeah, dude, we got out at the dump. I stood there as we're standing there taking, I'm talking like a minute, the, the security guys running at us, telling us you can't do that. Get the hell out of here. And so we, we almost got like two minutes of shots and she got, this machine was just going by as she did it. Oh, really? It was moving. Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a great, we didn't oh, plan I, see that. I, I just saw the driver like looking over like, what the fuck? <laughs> I see his face. That's awesome. Yeah. It was one of those ones. It's, it's one of my favorite, my favorite photos. It worked. It's just, uh, it just works for the album, especially with the vehicles, you know, the theme of like these giant. Yeah. Crueler vehicles. Well, yeah, that, that machine specifically, I mean, it's got like the, you know, the, the hydraulics and everything, which kind of risen and the, and the, the track for the wheels, all yeah. of that kind of resembles a little bit of what you got going on with your machines on yeah. the stage. That's it was uh, it was it was a fun one. I, I definitely was uh, it's probably my favorite favorite one ever. That's she awesome, nailed man. it. She nailed it. That's so funny. I didn't really think about the Wiener Schnitzel situation. I mean, there's one nearby me, and sometimes we indulge in the little mini corn dogs that they make. They're not bad. <laughs> yeah, I, Phil is funny because Phil when I showed him Phil Scrotz was also my manager. He didn't. He also played on the album, but he. Uh, I showed him these pictures and he's, he's like, I love the one at the dump, but I'm not so sure about the Wiener Schnitzel ones. <laughs> Shut up, Phil. Like, Wiener yeah. Schnitzel's awesome. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what do you know? Well, I've always wanted to take, this is like one of my dreams. I probably already mentioned this on the last time we spoke, but it's to take one of these Wiener Schnitzels. Because when you go to Germany and you have actual Wiener Schnitzel and, and lager, or, you know, you know, Hellas Lager. And then you come to the U.S. and you go to the Wiener Schnitzel and it's like, wait. Wow. I was like, let's make one of those into a proper German beer garden, you know, and then put mm -hmm. tables outside and giant mugs of beer. And so if you if you got an investor, I'll, I'll be happy to. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. I like the idea, though. That's really great. And, and I like the, you know, the, the shape of the Wiener Schnitzels really do lend itself for something like that, like a nice beer house. 
it's got history too, you know, yeah. and, and people know that's a Wiener Schnitzel that's now in a real Wiener Schnitzel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Probably only have to add an umlaut, and then you wouldn't get any copyright infringements. <laughs> that's true. That's true. X X Wiener Schnitzel is what we could call it. Or X Wiener Schnitzel, yeah, a Wiener Schnitzel of the past. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Um, so cool, man. The, the new album's coming out soon. So I'm, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to push this episode up. Because we do, I do have like a few banked in, but they're not time. There's no time. Okay. There's no albums linked to them, so those can be moved. But yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll move this up so we could be kind of around the same release of the album at least. Um, but for for everybody that's that's uh, watching and listening, uh, Cooler is available February 11th. Um, is it still on relapse? Are you still on relapse? Yep. So it's out through relapse. So there's going to be a million awesome vinyl variants that are going to take so forever. Many. There's so many colored because there's the, the album is so colorful that they just went nuts. Nice. Yeah. I love that. They do that. I love, uh, you know, I, I'm a collector, but I also don't do like, I'm not going to have five copies of the same album. I'm not that kind of collector, but it does give me like excitement to like pick the one that I want. This is, this is going to be the one, this is the variant that I'm looking for. Uh, even I'm if not I'm looking forward to being on the road with those dude, cause you got people are going to be like, I want the one with it. I'm like, wait, I don't know. What... <sighs> yeah. Pick it, find it. I don't know what to <laughs> <laughs> um, so do, when you're traveling now, I mean, now you're going to have an extra person with the guitarist. Um, how much, how many people do you travel with for tours? Well, um, I'll probably bring a sound guy too, John Coda, who also played drums on a couple of tracks on the album. Um, but he, he plays a band death eyes in San Diego and he does sound at the Casbah and everything, but he, he'll come on the road with me. Um, and, uh, so it'll just be the three of us, I think. Okay. All right. That's a lot of equipment for three guys, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's cool. I'm, I'm excited. I'm hoping that everything works out in terms of this upcoming Euro tour that you have. I uh, hope nothing gets canceled because yep. I know how much it sucks. And um, But the plan is that. And then you said you have some dates in LA in March. Yeah, LA, I think this March 6th through March 10th, I'll be doing about four shows on the West Coast. Okay. And then uh, go to Europe in the end of March into April. And then in May, there's a festival in Austin called Oblivion. And uh, that'll be, there'll be a run of about 10 shows around that sort of in the Southwest. And then San Diego will be the last one. So Casbah is coming up. Right. Oh, and, and speaking of, um, are you still focused on like beer on this podcast? Is that sort of. Uh, we can talk yeah. about it. Let's go. Yeah. Well, you, you got beer coming? I got a beer coming. So oh, we're doing uh, with who? I don't think I'm officially supposed to announce this, but uh, yeah. fuck it. Um, <laughs> uh, Thorn uh, in San Diego will be doing a, a black lager. Very um, cool. I wanted to do a, a Hellas style lager, but they, because it's metal, they just wanted to make it black. So we're doing mm. a black lager. Yeah, it'll have a little bit more roastiness to it. That's fine. Those oh no, those. sorry. Black, it, it, sorry, it's a. Um, I <laughs> fucked this up already. Oh, it's okay. a black Kolsch. A oh, cool. cooler Kolsch. Mm. Yeah. So it'll be very light bodied, but dark in color. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully keep the, the, the carbonation down a little bit. You know, I, I really, I really love that Kolsch when it's doesn't really hit you with the bite of the carbonation. It's just yeah. real smooth without much aftertaste, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Is there, sweet. so is there a plan for, I mean, you're probably still working that all, all out, but are you going to take some on the road with you to like have at shows? How is that going to work out? I don't even know if they, that's allowed, but we're going to do a show at the Casbah in May and that'll be, we'll have the cans there. We're still work, got to work that out with them. Um, and then maybe we'll do some, something special at, at Thorn. You know, the, the one down in um, Barrio Logan actually has some, it's a, the, the, the bunch of spaces there that are kind of all, work together a barbecue shop there's a couple performance places so we might maybe do something with them I don't, I don't know yet um get some bands or we're still talking but um they're really cool to have to have agreed to do that so i was stoked that's great that's great i, mean, I was gonna ask if you're you know you mentioned you're not drinking as much or you're taking a break uh, not really just just you know not, not trying to go crazy with it but I'm a, I'm a pretty, pretty solidly into the Pilsners and Lagers these days. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, me too. I, I, I still do some IPAs here and there, but like those days of mine where I would drink like 15% stouts with, you know, coconut and vanilla and all that, like I can't do that anymore. Just 
the diabetes is going to kill me. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> diabetes. Uh, but diabetes. Uh, the, the, the Pilsners and the Kolsch's and the lagers are so, especially if they're well done, if they're done properly, uh, there, there's nothing like it. There's nothing. Yeah. Like we're getting it. better at it. I, I'm pretty, uh, there's a, there's a, a company up in, um, North of LA, um, Anagrin. Anagrin. Yeah. Oh, that one is so good. <laughs> the Lagatha Lager. Yes, wow. the Lagatha. Wow, it's so good. <laughs> and it, it just Lagatha, you know, yeah. like, you know, what else do you have to say? I go, the only place I can find it is uh, Bevmo. So I'm kind of. I found it at Whole Foods a couple times out here in LA, the one by Fairfax by the, the, the food mark, uh, the. The farmer's market uh they've had it sometimes but i've been wanting to take a trip out to the brewery just because they've, they've i'm such a fan of the of the beers that i i, was like, I need to go up there become friends you know like, yeah, maybe you and i and phil could for the, could head up there and uh because i love i love that stuff um it's just a weird place that like, you wouldn't tour through there you know unless you were right. playing santa barbara or something yeah yeah, that's why I haven't done it because it's like, what am I? What I got to figure out what else I'm going to do. Like, I got to make it a worthy trip. There's got to be a food place and maybe something to look at, like some kind of museum or arcade or some something. There's got to be something else uh, than than just taking like an hour drive, you know, for beer. <laughs> And then sort of drive back properly. Yeah. yeah. Right. 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 But hey, you know, I'll keep. Uh, we can. You know, I'm working on a, a travel TV show where I go to breweries with musicians so um that's in the works right now and and we'll, maybe that's one of the episodes you me and phil we can drive up there <laughs> that'd be great we, we both are huge fans of that style of beer especially and i got my pretzel game on i've been making some good pretzels and what uh schnitzel we do a little Oktoberfest at my parents farm every uh fall now oh wow we, okay schnitzel you know polliner with the you know or whatever we can find is this farm in San Diego? No, it's in New Hampshire. So, like, oh, when I'm, okay. I'm kind of at home, we'll have a, you know, just get the fryer out there on the lawn, on the field, and, um, but yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, dude, thanks again for being on the show uh, again, and uh, I'm stoked. Hopefully, I'll come out and see you guys in March if if it all you know if the show happens and yep. things are everything's lined up. I'll come out and see you guys. Um, but everybody that's watching and listening, keep an eye out. The Euro tour is starts February 7th, fingers crossed. Uh, and it goes, it goes all the way down to February 21st. And then the LA shows March 6th at resident. Is that right? Yeah. And then you're going back to Europe in October. So, uh, that, that's good. And then the album February 11th on relapse pre-order it now. You know, if you're, this will be out before the album's out. So pre-order it now and get yourself a vinyl, one of the many a beautiful variants. And, uh, yeah, dude, thanks again. It's good seeing you. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Let's, let's make that, uh, make that trip happen and, uh, Absolutely. stay safe. Yeah. You too, brother. Take care. All right. See you. Bye.